良い点からそういった弊害的な意味で、um, In what ways、uh, has the, the success of the Wamba、uh, changed the, the situation surrounding the band?、Um, has it been all good or has there been any negative?、Uh, I don't, I think it's really been all good.、Um, the, it's broadened our audience base, it's,、uh, it's exposed us to a lot more people.、Um, there's really, I mean, whatever. Negatives there would be would be really piddling compared to the positive, so I don't think that I can't really think of anything negative.、Um, uh, we don't、uh, pander to the expanded audience in any way, we don't do any more <coughs> or less of Richie Valens music than we ever did in our set, so it's、uh, it really hasn't changed that much. You know, it's just it's nicer, things are more comfortable.、Uh, we you know we played larger places, we played you know for more people, but. As far as negatives go, there's virtually nothing. The other thing now, every time you kind of、uh, come up with a song, with a message, how will the wolf survive?、Uh, one time, one night. One time, one night, yeah.、Um, could it be that, that stuff like that is being overlooked because we're thinking of it as the La Bamba band?、Um, Overlooked only in the sense that、uh, fewer people bought those albums than bought La Bamba. You know, hopefully, the, the most positive aspect of La Bamba's success will be that people that are exposed to La Bamba will go search out songs, you know, albums like, you know, the other, other our, our own albums. So、um, I don't feel that it's being overlooked. You know, we just, we just hope that those people will, you know, look. Deep, you know, dig a little deeper as far as our, our recorded output and hopefully discover those records. Can you describe your uh, uh, contributions to the band as producer?、Uh, hmm. In what way do you think you changed the、uh, band sound? Do you think you just were able to more faithfully、uh, be producing on vinyl? Or were there any、um, other changes? I think that,、uh, well, I think that my role. On La Bamba is different than my role as on the other records. On the other records, it's、um, the, well, the,、uh, the last one I think was really a group production effort. You know, everyone really took an enormous amount of responsibility, much more so than in the past. They, I think that they be, the rest of the guys became less、uh, intimidated perhaps by the, you know, being in a studio. You know, once you know, you've done it a couple times, you understand what works and what doesn't. and Um, I think my role in the first two records was really just sort of like、um, helping to interface that process because I had made you know, quite a few more records than they did. And, you know, suggestions as far as、uh, arrangements and、uh, just ideas. But I, I think really the group has become much better versed as far as the, their own, you know, like the songs that we write ourselves, that everybody really contributes a great deal now. Whereas before it was, you know, we just sort of had to develop that. Those paths of communication, both within ourselves and then addressing the technological aspect of how to get it on the tape and then onto the vinyl. you know. I think on the Bamba, my role was, I think, considerably expanded because we were doing both, rec- both the By the Light of the Moon and La Bamba at the same time, and La Bamba became my personal responsibility. And as much as dealing with the movie people, you know, like constantly, they were, every day they would change everything, you know. Hour to hour, they would change what they wanted, what they needed, how they wanted it to sound, how they wanted it to, you know, the order, the solo, you know, everything changed every day. So it was really a function of dealing with them, capturing those songs in the way that the, the producers of the movie wanted for a particular scene, and then they would go and rewrite the scene, and I have to change everything, you know. So <clears throat> some songs were like,、uh, I mean, like 11 different mixes.、Uh, There were 30 some different versions of Come On, Let's Go,、um, different vocal things. You know, they, they just change their mind. You know, movies are movies. They don't, you know, they, they, they're constantly flying by the proverbial seat of their pants, which I know will not translate into a Japanese idiom. They're constantly changing their,、uh, their minds. So it was really just a, a matter of dealing with them and getting it, you know, working that out. And the, another situation that、uh, became. My responsibility was we were doing a movie soundtrack 
album and a movie soundtrack at the same time, and they were completely different. So a lot of times on the same 24-track tape, you'd have, you know, just bass and drums, and then two different, completely different things for the movie and for the album. Uh, because, you know, the only... There are a lot of scenes in the movie that we did the music for where it wouldn't be us singing, it would be that Rudy, I don't know, I'm assuming that everyone's seen the movie, the Rudy character, the guy that Richie replaces in that original band, would sing, or there'd be some background music, and then that same song was going to be in the soundtrack album with full Los Lobos uh, production, and, you know, like all of our voices and all of our guitars and all of our solos and everything um, else like that, so it was really kind of a, a juggling act as far as, you know, doing this for the movie and this for the album, and you know, trying to make everything work. When you first took up uh, the tour of producing the band, had you thought things long term in the sense that you thought maybe well, you know, eventually all the band members will be able to handle their own parts and will it eventually become a group of uh, production as opposed to uh, your own uh, production? Um, yeah, I think so. I think everybody, uh, you know, we're, I think, the kind of group that uh, everyone is, is, are, is such good musicians, and the fact that, you know, that we're, you know, having been around the track, I mean, as far as, you know, being together for so long, having experienced so many things together, that I, I, I you know, we, I always assumed that everyone's responsibilities would grow as the band got um, further into their recording career. Um, when I first started producing them, I was still a member of the Blasters, and I wasn't even, sh you know, I'd, I'd, my initial thing was I was I thought I was going to still be a Blaster and just, you know, sort of work with these guys, you know, I didn't really, when I first started, I thought I was still going to be a Blaster, you know, then I sort of like gradually hung out with them more and played with them more and sort of said, well, gosh, this is a great deal of fun, maybe I should rethink this whole thing. So then, how did you explain the, let's go back, how did you explain the difference between the original, I guess it was the EP, and the first reality, and the first EP seemed to be more devoted to the first album, the first LP, like one the, um, I'll tell you that the, uh, when that, when the band first started, the EP, they were so shocked that there was any acceptance at all for what they were doing. They had come out of nine years of playing nothing but folkloric Mexican music. And nothing but. No rock and roll, basically. No, very little, I should say. Not, not none. But it was like they had really just sort of said, you know, like not very long prior to that recording of that album, well, let's see if we can incorporate some of these other elements. And they were, you know, we, front, we got the record deal through a lot of basically arm twisting, you know, the, the record company was sort of like saying, well, you know, we like them, we'll put the, you know, we'll do the CP, no one's going to buy it, the, you know, they're great guys, you know, the, the president of the record company, his friends said they wouldn't invite him to any more parties if he didn't sign the band, more or less, so he, you know, the, the whole attitude going into that record was, was, uh, was sort of like, well, you know, here's a bone, you know, just try and get it done for less than $5,000. <laughs> And the band sort of, you know, they were like, well, you know, gee, this is great, we're in a studio, but it was very much a, a black and white, grainy, eight millimeter documentary of what the band was, you know, it's not really going in and making an album. And I think that probably about two months in or a month into the making of the, the first album, everyone sort of said, well, golly, you know, maybe, maybe this is really something a lot greater than what we imagined. When... I think when Louie and David brought uh, Will the Wolf Survive into uh, rehearsal, and it was such an important and powerful song, everyone just sort of, it was like a, what's the word, an epiphany of sorts, you know, it was just sort of like, golly, this is, you know, this is some, certainly something we could, I mean, I, it, we didn't think of it then, but it was sort of like, that was the a, a watermark in a way that we said, that the band sort of realized that there was something that we could do all the music that we're doing and we could incorporate all the influences that we have and we could really make uh, I don't want to say a statement but we could sort of create a context in which Los Lobos could really be a viable group and it just sort of like went from that point and then releasing that record 
and you know getting the the critical acclaim and just sort of like the whole thing sort of shooting off from there and you know the success that accrued at that point really sort of like made everyone think well golly this is great because I know me personally prior to that I thought well my own feeling was this is a wonderful band they're great musicians I love this music no one's ever going to buy it we're never going to sell you know be lucky to sell 100,000 records every time I, that'd be great I mean I would if, you, if I could have written a contract at that point saying that's what we would sell I would have said fine you know like, where's the pen let me do it and then it uh, sort of just sort of became uh, something uh, much larger and much more much deeper and I think that when we realized that there wasn't anybody else doing anything remotely like what we were doing it sort of dawned on us that this was special and that uh, we had a responsibility more or less to, to make you know, important records. Oh, that sounds so pompous, but to make records that were deeper than just your average record, I guess. I that sounds pompous too. Oh, <laughs> I think one thing you wanted to ask you was where the original injection of rock and roll came from. Uh, well, the whole time that these the guys were you know doing this folkloric music, it wasn't like their ears were closed. I mean, we it was sort of odd in which you know I grew up in Philadelphia, they grew up in East Los Angeles. But the, we, we share so many influences, you know. We all listen to basically the same records. We all grew up in the 60s listening to American radio in the 60s and early 70s when it was still okay to listen to the radio. And uh, it wasn't like their ears were closed. I mean, they were well aware of everything that was happening. That was more or less the kick in the pants that got them to play rock and roll was this, this uh, that scene that was exploding in, in Los Angeles in the early 70s. I mean, with it was a wonderful wonderful time you know the blasters and X and the plugs and you know dare I say even the go-go's but I mean there were so many other bands that no one ever heard of that were really really making important uh, musical statements and there was a great scene and people were going out there were a million clubs you could play every night of the week and people would go and it was it was just wonderful and that was you know they weren't close to anything what the whole time they were doing the folkloric music they were still listening they were still you know, receiving this information, receiving, you know, well, you know, gee, this is, there's this thing happening here, there's a scene happening here, and maybe, you know, we, we could be a part of this, you know, probably not as a folkloric band, but let's see if we can't try this out, and I think the first time that I saw them playing rock and roll was the first time that they played rock and roll as Los Lobos was at a show with the Blasters, and I heard somebody had a tape of the show, and they were you could hear in their voices they were just shocked I mean just dumbfounded that people were were accepting them that they were you know that people you know the audience was going nuts because they hadn't heard anybody doing this music ever and they were just kept going like well god you like that one huh well well okay well here's another one and it, it's sort of like the same kind of thing but it's a little different we we, we, we hope you we hope you like it but it's you know and I swear that that's verbatim what what the the stage pattern sounds like they were shocked amazed that people would like this music and then you know from that one gig basically everything unfolded you know I mean, they got other gigs in Hollywood I met them you know the the world at large took note that there was this really special thing happening it's pretty funny I wish I could hear that tape I wish there was I could put my hands on it. I don't know who had it I just heard it one night it was hysterical Oh, by the way, this all goes. In your own cases, um, well, I mean, you're not exactly supervised, musical supervisor of the band, but, but in terms of uh, the direction, um, if, if, do the guys in the band consciously adhere to like their roots, like uh, what, what they, what's it called, Montenegro? Yeah. Music like they, they say, well, you know, we got to stick by this. No, I'd say. If anything, it would be the opposite of that. It would be like, how can we use this style or this instrument? How could we use it in a completely alternate context? How could we take like a Baja Sexto and use it on a Cajun song? Or how could we twist this this thing into something else? And it's, I think that's where we differ from a lot of other um, roots-based bands in that we love and respect and again a little pomposity here possibly understand the the music that we love I mean we, it's like country music or Cajun music or Notania music we, we love this music and we appreciate it and you know would never
do what we consider to be an impropriety or an injustice to it. At the same time, we don't worship it. So when we say, well, if we're going to do this kind of song, we have to do it completely by the book, and you know, we can't dare do this or this or this. We just do what we like and mix it together, and with our own personal standards and integrity, generally it comes out sounding like something that is treated with a great deal of love and respect. You know, it's there's groups that we know who are dear friends of ours who, whose music we love who have a very um, um, sort of uh, doctrinaire outlook as far as like blues is blues and Cajun is Cajun and you know that's that and the twain shall never meet as long as I'm standing here and it's, to me and to the rest of us I think it's it's an attitude while I admire on one sense that there you know people who feel so strongly that there's a standard worth, you know, flying a flag for at the same time for us. And I think for the way that modern music is changing, I think it's a little bit short-sighted in that I think the most important music being made are people who are combining textures and combining idioms and combining um, various world musics and synthesizing something, a new form. I mean, that's the way any language develops and any vocabulary develops by, you know, exploring and synthesizing and bringing in and you know, using the good and throwing away the bad, and that's what we try to do. Or Cajun or blues or anything else, they're all marriages. Of yeah, they're all, that's stars. right, that's the way they all, in, exact, good point, you know, that's the way they all came about, and in our own small way, we're just trying to, you know, keep that tradition going, that there's new forms being generated by old forms, by people who are unafraid to, to sort of shake the roots a little bit, shake mm -hmm. the foundations. Mm -hmm. Is it a Do you have a place at all first trying to fit in uh, among these guys considering their roots are so much well, well different in that they you know, were performing with them with the music you said you have so much roots and they were both listening to the group listening to the same kind of radio but still they were involved in each other kind of music to be totally honest no it was always it was so comfortable from the very first time that uh, no I never really felt that, that it was something that just seemed totally natural is what I had always wanted to do to play in a band that could do justice to so many different styles and to do it without you know without obnoxiousness you know what I mean it's like they didn't see themselves as you know any special thing and I certainly don't see myself as any special thing but they were able to do these things so wonderfully that it was always just a, a perfect musical um, marriage, I guess, for want of a better word, that it, it, I never felt uh, the least bit strange. I mean, it took a second to learn, you know, a second. It took a couple of weeks to learn how to play Norteño properly, but it was some... The way that my musical upbringing was that um, and the, the people that I played with in Philadelphia was that if you called yourself a musician, that meant that you could do virtually everything well. I mean, you had to be able to play jazz, you had to be able to read, you had to be able to play changes, and you had to be able to play blues without sounding like, uh, you know, somebody just came out of music school. You know, you had to be able to do all the stuff. And it was, a, it was a great scene in Philly, and it was a great scene in L.A. I was always, I mean, I consider myself very lucky to have lived in times where this was the operative mode of thinking. You know, I, mean, I would have great been alive in 1949, too. But um, this, uh, the, that approach has always been the way that I approached music. And meeting these guys and learning that we had so many of the same, you know, records that we both, that we all, both, that we all loved and, you know, st obscurities like Bloodwind Pig. I mean, who the hell were Bloodwind Pig? But these guys were big fans. And I was a huge fan and it was like, God, you know, you, and it was, uh, there's a lot of stuff like that, you know, it just seemed, that, uh, that's just one example. I could think, you know, there's probably 150 more, you know, obscure blues guys, obscure Cajun guys that I was into that I didn't think anybody else had ever heard of that they were big fans of. And the Blasters really were the same way. I mean, there was just this enormous shared community and this sense of, uh, you know, like, God, you you know, you heard of this guy too? Yeah, I got all, you know, it's like, so coming from that and that point of view, it sort of like made it, the whole thing seem very organic. It was like, Wow, great! We could do this. Wow, you know, now we could do all these jump tunes that we've always wanted to do, but you know, we couldn't really do, and all that kind of, you know, that sort of approach really so is what started it. Mutually enlightening. Yeah, utterly. Yeah, um, Getting back to this question about like, how you 
apply your uh, your individual skills. Uh, I, I guess the band has uh, developed stylistically, um, maybe expanded stylistically, would be a better way of putting it, to have mm -hmm. more breadth. Um, in terms of like a future direction, do you th can you see yourself changing radically, or do you think it's just a matter of like slowly but surely? I think it's, um, it's always, it's, you know, since the beginning, it's always been a, a very, again, this word organic evolution. You know, the band is always sort of like, taken these steps and made these changes and written these songs and developed this this context in a very organic way and I can't imagine anything especially the success of La Bamba changing that you know I think that it's um, we are the people that we are and I think our personalities are pretty well formed at this point you know no one in the band's under 32 so it's like I don't think that this next record is going to be an enormous departure in an abstract sense, but I do feel that the added, perhaps, responsibility of having been exposed to that many more people through La Bamba means that while not putting pressure on ourselves, we have an awareness now that there's more people listening, that this record should be extraordinarily good. Not that we wouldn't make an extraordinary, or try to make an extraordinarily good record in any event, but it's just you're just sort of aware that, you know, there's two and a half million people in America anyway that are now aware of you and, you know, hopefully will want to remain, you know, aware of what you're doing and perhaps you should make a, a record that's going to be uh, an enlightening experience for them, so. Is there any chance it could end by just being a novelty thing? Um, no. The little Bamba guys, you know, remember them? I don't think mm -hmm. that, that it could possibly ever happen. I don't think that we... I think that those things tend to happen with people who really sort of shoot for that one time. Thing. Well, they don't shoot for it, but I mean, they, they just sort of hit every, you know, just, you know, manipulate every situation, try and squeeze as much out of out of a thing as, as that thing will allow, whereas we our whole approach to La Bamba is more, more of a amusement, really. It's like such a shock to us that the thing was a success at all that, you know, I don't think anyone could accuse us of selling out to do it or selling out since, I mean, having had the success, we didn't really go out and, you know, sell, we didn't certainly didn't go out and sell that La Bamba song to, you know, 19 different companies. I mean, that's not our version that, I don't know if it's over here, but there's like four or five different commercials in America running that song. It's not us. It's the original soundtrack. And it's, I think that it's those sort of, that sort of approach which makes for one-shot novelties, you know. I think we have a pretty strong core audience. We have you know, people that are fans that are aware of us and that will, you know, hopefully buy our records that that novelty thing I don't think is really going to exist. Whether or not we're going to sell quite as many records next time out, I mean, who can say? I would frankly doubt it just because there was such a synergy with the movie being an enormous hit and the record being there and, you know, that that's just sort of like one of those explosive situations that occurs very rarely. There's not going to be a movie with our next album, <laughs> and we don't expect that same sort of uh, excitement. But it's, you know, as far as the dollarly thing, I really don't think can happen. You know, we are going to remain who we are, and, you know, we're going to make records for a long time. And, uh, you know, just hopefully go make a good record. Are you going to be producing any uh, any young acts? Um, I just I finished a, a record by a group called the Paladins, whose last record I produced. Um, that I don't know when or what label it's coming out on in Japan. It's th they're on Alligator in America. It's it's pretty straight ahead blues, but uh, I think they're extremely good. And I'm working on a record by a country singer named Katie Moffat, a woman who's. I guess I shouldn't say country anymore because it doesn't sound like a country record. It's just a, it's a country-based, shall we say, record. Uh, I don't, again, I don't know what label it's going to be out on in Japan. And there's a few other projects um, that I'm up for. You know, it's there's so many people producing records these days. It's like an enormous. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of strange. <laughs> it seems like there's, you know, every time you, I get. You know, the people approach me about a project. It always seems like there's 25 other guys that they're talking to at the same time. It's really it's become 
dare I say, a buyer's market. So there's, I'm being talked to about projects, but I never know anymore, you know, who, if I'm going to do them or not. I mean, Is that right? It's really kind of silly in a way. You know, it seems like there's, there's like 10 or so guys right now that any project that comes up, you know, hopefully my name is in there, but, you, you know, you hear, well, we're talking to this, this, and this, and it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Why not? Everybody else is. <laughs> do you, like, stay abreast of mainstream pop music? I think so. I try to. What do you have to say about uh, the current pop scene? Um, well, when you say pop scene, I sort of go, you know, I don't know. I, there's wonderful music being made all over the world, and um, there's a lot of really exciting uh, things happening. There's, uh, there's a record I've been listening to a lot by a Nigerian, I believe, a guy named Salif Keita, that I think is amazing. Just it's like a combination of like Arabic African music with heavy synthesizers I could, I could call it I mean it's, it sounds like a, like a Peter Gabriel record made in some other planet mm. um, what else is good there's a group called Treater Wright from Boston that I like a lot who are making who with they're sort of like a Steely Dan meets uh, Howl and Wolf they're really Great lyricists and they're very oblique and but it's real like dark rootsy dark blues kind of stuff uh, lots of you know good young bands um, all over the place I, it's I think it's a really encouraging time as far as you know what's selling the zillion records it's like that stuff always sells a zillion records you know it's techno crap a lot of this European music really just sort of puts me asleep but I think that um, I think that in general, it's the there's a real healthy scene. That there are really good bands all over the world writing really, you know, good songs. And I think trying to develop an original vision, you know, that's the most important thing. You know, there's always there's always been, there will always be, you know, on into eternity, a million people making music. It's the, I think that young bands, even extremely young bands, are becoming aware of how important it is to to find some originality to try and find a way for themselves that it's not so cool to be the clash anymore it's not so cool to be even the blasters anymore you know you really have to to find uh, some way of saying something that somebody that nobody else is saying and that's the most encouraging thing I think about what's happening right now I really love that uh, amphitheater the yeah. Uh, yeah it's fun I hope so. I know we had a good. That's where we played with uh, Dennis Brown the last time, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a great show. It was, it was a wacky tour. What's going on in Tokyo these days? Everybody in the world is coming in. It's yeah. just the high end, you know. I'm not going to pay anybody that at the price they ask. Yeah. Man, everybody guy that did Soul Mucosa. Yeah. Uh, Manu Dibango. He was here recently. <laughs> How was he? <laughs> I didn't get a chance uh, to see him, but I mean, everybody. <laughs> you name it, they're here. I heard uh, what, Room Full of Blues was here recently. Um, it, did you I, see that? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Somebody told me that. Is that right? Yeah. Irma Thomas was just here. Really? Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. yeah, we're playing, as soon as we go home, in a couple of days, actually, after we get home, we're doing the Jazz uh, Heritage Festival in New Orleans. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's that's like music heaven. Yeah, really. It really is. It's actually heaven on many different levels. It's the best, the best group, the best music, like twenty four hours a day for two weeks. And it's like you can't go anywhere without hearing something. Uh -huh. like, especially yeah. ninety million things you've never heard of, like gospel and uh -huh. obscure Caribbean groups, and obscure African groups, and all. the gospel tent in itself is. You know, like you, you get this list of all the people that are playing. And you go, oh God, well, I gotta see Al Green. I gotta see Fastamina. I gotta see this guy. This guy. And you walk by the gospel tent. You just like <laughs> can't get out of it. <laughs> what the hell am I gonna see anything else for? This is incredible. I'll quit. 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 I'll quit.